There was a, uh, a government official, government employee, excuse me, sitting in his office, and he was waiting around, waiting for something to do. I guess he got a bit bored. He saw a file cabinet there. He'd seen it every day for a long, long time. He thought, I need to look through that thing. So he goes to this file cabinet and starts rummaging through and finds in it a rather curious-looking lamp. He thinks, that will look rather good on my mantelpiece at home. So he takes it home, and yeah, you guessed. He was cleaning it up, and as he, as he rubbed the lamp, it, a genie popped out. You've heard this one before, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. The genie granted him three wishes. So he said, uh, just because he wanted one, he said, my first wish is, oh, I wish I had a nice cold Coke. No, this is not a Colonel Tom Jones story, by the way. <laughs> I wish I had a nice cold Coke. And once he got a bit of caffeine in him, he could think more rationally and see the opportunity that was before him. So with his second wish, he said, I wish I had a brand new Aston Martin convertible. And lo and behold, not only did it happen, but he found himself driving it. And there he is in this beautiful car, the top down. It's a gorgeous day. His nice, perfect Coca-Cola by his side. And he's thinking, I could do this for a while. So I've got one more wish. I need to make it count. So he said, I wish I never had to work again in my life. And puff, just like that, he was back in his government office. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Inauguration Day happening this week. There you go. <laughs> Today's story is a lot about sort of waiting. But really... The story of our waiting, as told in Luke chapter 24, and certainly turn to that portion of scripture, if you will. The story of waiting starts with a very hectic weekend, quite frankly. It was the point where the disciples had gone through Good Friday, and now here it was, Sunday morning, and stories of Jesus' sightings were coming around. People had been telling of Christ re resurrecting from the dead. And it started out with... Mary Magdalene and the ladies coming to tell the disciples, Jesus is alive. Mary said, I had an encounter with him, causing then John and Simon Peter to run to the tomb. And Simon goes inside, sees no body in the tomb, of course, just see the, uh, sees the, the, the strips of cloth and the, and the linen in which Jesus had been wrapped. And then Simon Peter and John return to the disciples because, as it says in the book of John, they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And the next thing happens is Cleopas and his friend come along. These were the guys that were on the way to Emmaus when suddenly Jesus comes along. And they felt their hearts burning as Jesus opened the scripture to them. So they turned around and went back to Jerusalem so they might tell the disciples what they had seen. Which made the disciples turn around and say, it's true, he is risen. To be honest, if the disciples thought that weekend had been kind of busy and hectic, they got some pretty busy and hectic days still to come. But today we get a lot more at this occurrence in Luke chapter 26, uh, 24. excuse me. And what we're going to see here is a couple of things that are quite important. First of all, for the disciples, there was a great importance in, first of all, believing in the risen Lord. Second of all, we'll see a sense of preparation for being equipped by God. And then we will consider the responsibility that the equipped believer has in the world in which we live. But before we do that, please join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we gather here today as a group of believers. We believe Lord, that you died on that cross. We believe that you were raised on the third day. And we believe that you ascended into heaven and now sit at the right hand of your Father. We believe these things. And we believe, Lord, that you equip us. You equip us to be your emissaries in this world. Today, I want it to be a reminder to each one of us what that belief means. And the implications of being equipped. And let us remember, Lord, how important it is for us to get into this world that so desperately needs believers who are ready. So please, Heavenly Father, just as we wait, as we listen, 
impart upon us the importance of those things. But Lord, in the midst of it all, help us to understand what it means to wait upon you, to wait upon your Holy Spirit, to wait to be called. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I think there are many times as we read Scripture we might wonder if the disciples really understood who they were following. It wasn't until Matthew chapter 16 where Peter suddenly says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that suddenly there was a realization of who this teacher, this rabbi was. But even with the exclamation, the implications of following the Messiah, the Son of the living God, was not clear to the disciples. Therefore, on Good Friday, when he died, they thought that was it. He's done. He's dead. And with the exception of John, they scattered like rats, nowhere to be seen on Good Friday. So on Sunday morning, they weren't expecting to hear about Jesus rising from the dead. They didn't run to the tomb to see if it had occurred. They, as far as they were concerned, Jesus was done. He was dead. In fact, Luke tells us that when the women came and told the disciples that they had seen Jesus, they didn't believe them because, it says, the words seemed to be like nonsense. That's what it says. So to the exclamation, Jesus is alive, the response was, don't be ridiculous. That's really what was going on here. And let's be honest, it does sound kind of ridiculous. Let's look at it from a non-believer standpoint. It's sort of an absurd story. Even though Jesus had dropped, hit, dropped hint after hint, given clue after clue, still the concept seemed rather crazy. So the disciples really were gearing up for life without Jesus. They were gearing up for whatever was next. I wonder what that would look like. I wonder what went through their minds. I think it's very probable they would have stayed together. If they got very close, I see no reason that they wouldn't have continued to stay very close. It's possible that some, maybe all, but some of them would have started to follow at some point another rabbi, another teacher. But they would never forget Jesus. They'd remember the crucifixion, yes, but boy, they'd remember the, 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 the journey that he took them on. The teachings, the parables, the casting out of demons, the incredible healings and miracles that Jesus performed. Oh, they'd get together and they'd talk about these things. And they'd also appreciate Jesus for the fact that they had each other. Jesus was their common link. He was the one that brought them together. And now they were able to share in that life. That's perhaps what they were preparing for in life. But of course, that's not what happened, is it? Jesus did rise from the dead. Jesus did appear in front of them, even ate food in front of them. And then it says he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Their eyes were suddenly opened to God's word and suddenly they understood it. Jesus was once dead and now he's alive. And not only did they understand it, but very importantly, Scripture says they believed it. They believed it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've been around believers, and perhaps I can even pinpoint times in my life when we can count ourselves guilty of not truly believing in the resurrected Christ. Oh, the clues have been given. The stories have been told. We sung, up from the grave he arose, but we show nothing of believing in the resurrected Christ. Because the implications of his resurrection imply action and faith that quite frankly bring us out of our comfort zone. Be very careful of that comfort zone. It is a very dangerous place to be. Because in your comfort zone, you are saying, I'm good here, and quite frankly, God, while I'm here, I don't need you because I'm in my comfort zone. I believe God has called us to take us beyond that comfort zone. That's when he is able to guide us and to support us and strengthen us. And so often we can be guilty of gathering together to remember the stories, to remember the great things we've heard, to read the great teachings of Jesus, to marvel at the miracles. Sometimes we can be guilty of doing that. Sometimes we can be guilty of having fellowship in his honor. He is the one that brings us together. That, I think, is the life the disciples would have had were it not for the resurrection. So the question this morning you have to ask yourselves is, is that really believing? 
do I really show a life that believes in the resurrection? Okay, so the disciples' eyes were open to the truth. They did believe. And what Jesus does then is he recalls a number of prophecies. He talks about the things that the Old Testament prophets said about him. And then he says to the disciples, you are witnesses to these things. These are the things that they said would occur. The prophet said, you are witnesses to these things. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send you the promise of my father. But first, before I do anything else, what you need to do now, your next, next very important task, says Jesus, is to wait. Is to wait. Right here in the city of Jerusalem. The city where I was killed, the city that is probably the most dangerous place for you to be, I want you to wait here. This, I feel, is a very important instruction given to the disciples. Because they were preparing for the enormous task of bringing the gospel to the world. And that first task was to wait here. Yes, they were waiting for the Holy Spirit. Yes, they were waiting for the power from on high. But I think there's a great importance to them waiting as opposed to receiving the Holy Spirit in that moment. Commissioner Brengel, in the devotional that we would have read yesterday, makes it very clear the value of their waiting at this particular point. Commissioner Brengel says this, Waiting on God empties us that we may be filled. Few wait until they are emptied, and hence few are filled. It is far easier to plunge madly at this thing and that, and do, 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 till life and heart are exhausted in joyless and comparatively fruitless toil than it is to wait on God in patient faith until he comes and fills us with the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, in that time of waiting, there was an emptying that was going on. First, their fears had to be dealt with. Their fears, they were to go outside of their comfort zone. Their fears had to be dealt with. Then they had to deal with their egos, which reared their ugly heads from time to time, as we know. And then they had to release any sense of self. Release any personal ambition that they had. And therefore, by emptying themselves, they were preparing for themselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Last week I talked about slowing down, not getting ahead of Jesus. This week the concept of, uh, of the message, the central concept, is that of waiting, to slowing down to a halt as we wait on the Lord. That time of waiting is a time of preparation. It's a time of stillness. It's a time of listening. It's a time for us to align ourselves with the will of God and to be ready for His timing. Not ours, but his. Therefore, in faith and with great patience, we must wait. What does that waiting look like? What are we waiting for? What should we be doing as we wait? I have a, a video illustration this morning that I think actually shows us quite well how we should be prepared. So thank you, Betty, for my illustration. <laughs> Hello, my name is John. I'm here for the telegraph job. Okay, John. We'll just uh, have a seat right here. When we're ready to interview you, we'll uh, call you back through this door, okay? Okay, thank you. Hello, sir. Are you here for the telegraph job? Yes, I am. Okay, and what is your name, sir? My name is Thomas. All right, Thomas. We'll just have a seat right here. When we're ready to interview, we'll call you back through this door. Okay, thank you. Well, don't let them fool you. I've been here for over 30 minutes already.
Thank you, sir, but it appears the job's been filled. What? Who got the job? Oh, the young man who was just in here, uh, Thomas. Well, wait a minute, I was here before him. How is it fair that he got hired for the job and I wasn't even called in for an interview? Oh, we did call both of you back there for an interview. He was just the only one who was paying attention. The important part of waiting is listening, isn't it? Listening and believing. And just as I've met people who don't believe worship God, so I've met people who are waiting without listening. In Luke 24, 46 to 48, Jesus gives the disciples a very clear mission. It's what Jesus says. This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And we share that same mission. It's the same news that every believer has been given. And we have been sent into this world to proclaim that truth. You see, at some point, our waiting has to turn to action. But if you're not listening, you can't hear the instruction. You see, waiting in and of itself involves work. Waiting is investing time and effort. It involves preparation. And then once God has chosen us to move, we must be ready for action. Otherwise, we miss out. And just as the first applicant in our video there waited to be called, so many of us can be waity, waiting to be called while paying no attention whatsoever. Friends, if you're not hearing God, I think there's one of two reasons for it. Either you don't believe he's saying anything, or you're not listening to what he's saying. And quite honestly, I believe that age and rank have nothing to do with that, because I've met both officers and lay people, I've met both young and old, who are ineffective for Christ because of a lack of belief or a lack of listening. I stood on this platform and others many times and I've urged congregations towards the urgency of a mission, of the importance of us ministering to the world out there. The things we are doing as a congregation, but there are important things that only you can do with the mission field that you live around. It's the call of our general. Our general is calling us to be mobilized. He says to us, we are, we are to be God's witness, to be God's salt and light in the world of despair and darkness. We are called to a ministry of transformation. And then General Cox goes on to say that the Salvation Army was raised up for no other purpose but to bring people into the kingdom of God. You hear that? The general says the Salvation Army was raised up for no other purpose but to bring people into the kingdom of God. It's our call as salvationists. We've been told it all of our lives, but I fear we're in our comfort zone and too few are listening. I've heard it said, even from this congregation, that perhaps the days of this army as we know it are waning away. I desperately hope that's incorrect. But if it is, it's because we as salvationists either don't believe or are not listening. We're staying in our comfort zone. But today I want to remind you. I want to urge you, empty everything. Wait upon the Lord and empty everything of yourself. Your fears, your ego, your sense of self, your ambitions. And then allow him to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. That you might tell people the Messiah suffered and rose from the dead on the third day to forgive us of our sins and give us an eternal hope. That's the message we've been charged to bring to the world. It's a message that the world needs to hear. But it can only be given by people who have emptied themselves and been filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing a chorus this morning. You know it well. Many of you know it well. Spirit of the living God, pour afresh on me. 
Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And as we sing that this morning, I invite you to come and to kneel at this place. This place of emptying and this place of filling. This place of preparation. This meeting place where we can meet with the resurrected Christ. This morning, don't lose this opportunity. But come and kneel at this place. Come and bow before our resurrected Lord. Join with me as we sing together in this wonderful chorus. And sing it to God as though it's your personal prayer. Spirit of the Maybe, Lord, we're not thinking about lunch. That's not our priority right now. That's not the thing that's out there that concerns us most. May it not be the, the schedule that perhaps you've got this day. Let us not concentrate on that, thinking that's the priority. Help us to recognize, Lord, that our calling as salvationists, to bring people into the kingdom of God, their lives our priority. And to do that, Heavenly Father, we must believe in you as our resurrected Savior. And Heavenly Father, this morning, I don't believe there's anyone that doesn't want to do service for you. I don't believe there's anyone here that doesn't desire to follow a calling that you have on our hearts. So I pray, therefore, Lord, that we're somehow renewed of that calling and that belief this morning. Lord, if there's anything inside of us that prohibits us from being effective for you. And very often we can see that sort of in our disappointment in things, our, our attitude towards things. Heavenly Father, if we need to be emptied, I pray that we might be emptied this day. So that we, each one of us, can be filled with your Holy Spirit. And to go into that world. And to tell them about you. To tell them about the Tell them about the hope that comes from you. Spirit of the Friends, as always, it's been a joy to worship with you this morning. But I do urge you, there's a world out there that so desperately needs you. There's a world around you, where you live, that so desperately needs you. But only, only if you're equipped with the Holy Spirit.